Upon a lacal, my garden of roses, the memo has been released. And I'm just going to sit here and read it to you, because honestly, what better choice do I have? Dear Chairman, on January 29th, 2018, the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, here and after the committee, voted to disclose publicly a memorandum containing classified information provided to the committee in connection with its oversight activities. As provided by Clause 11G of Rule X of the House of Representatives, the committee has forwarded this memorandum to the President based on its determination that the release of the memorandum would serve the public interest. The Constitution vests the President with the authority to protect national security secrets from disclosure. As the Supreme Court has recognized, it is the President's responsibility to classify, declassify, and control access to information bearing on our intelligence sources and methods and national defense. In order to facilitate appropriate congressional oversight, the executive branch may entrust classified information to the appropriate committees of Congress, as it has done in with, with the committee's oversight activities here. The executive branch does so on the assumption that the committee will responsibly protect such classified information consistent with the laws of the United States. The committee has now determined that the release of the memorandum would be appropriate. The executive branch across administrations of both parties has worked to accommodate congressional requests to declassify specific materials in the public interest. However, public release of classified information by unilateral action of the legislative branch is extremely rare and raises significant separation of powers concerns. Accordingly, the committee's request to release the memorandum is interpreted as a request for declassification pursuant to the president's authority. The president understands that the protection of our national security represents his highest obligation. Accordingly, he has directed lawyers and national security staff to assess the declassification request consistent with the established standards governing the handling of declassified information, including those under Section 3.1D of Executive Order 13526. Those standards permit declassification when the public interest in disclosure outweighs any need to protect the information. The White House review process also included input from the Office of the National Director, the Director of National Intelligence, and the Department of Justice. Consistent with this review and these standards, the President has determined that declassification of the memorandum is appropriate. Based on this assessment in light of the significant public interest in the memorandum, the President has authorized the declassification of the memorandum. To be clear, the memorandum reflects the judgments of its congressional authors. The President understands that oversight concerning matters related to the memorandum may be continuing. Though circumstances leading to the declassification through this process are extraordinary, the executive branch stands ready to work with Congress to accommodate oversight requests consistent with applicable standards and processes, including the need to protect intelligent sources and methods. Counsel to the President, Donald F. McGahn II. And now, the actual memo. This memorandum provides members an update on significant facts relating to the committee's ongoing investigation into the Department of Justice and Federal Bureau of Investigation and their use of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act during the 2016 presidential election cycle. Our findings, which are detailed below, one, raise concerns with the legitimacy and legality of certain DOJ and FBI interactions with the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, and two, represent a troubling breakdown of legal processes established to protect the American people from abuses related to the FISA process. On October 21st, 2016, the Department of Justice and FBI sought and received a FISA probable cause order, not under Title VII, authorizing electronic surveillance on Carter Page from the, uh, from the uh, FISA court. Page is a U.S. citizen who served as a volunteer advisor to the Trump presidential campaign. Consistent with requirements under FISA, the application had to be first certified by the director or deputy director of the FBI. It then required the approval of the Attorney General, Deputy, Deputy Attorney General, or the Senate-confirmed Assistant Attorney General for the National Security Division. The FBI and DOJ obtained one initial FISA warrant targeting Carter Page and three FISA renewals from the FISA courts. 
As required by statute, a FISA order on an American citizen must be renewed by the FISA court every 90 days, and each renewal requires a separate finding of probable cause. Then Director James Comey signed three FISA applications in question on behalf of the FBI, and Deputy Director Andrew McCabe signed one. Then Deputy Attorney General Sally Yates, then Acting D Deputy Attorney General Dana Buent, and then uh, and Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein each signed one or more FISA applications on behalf of the DOJ. Due to the sensitive nature of foreign intelligence activity, FISA submissions, including renewals be uh, before the FISA court, are classified. As such, the public's confidence in the integrity of FISA process depends on the court's ability to hold the government to the highest standard particularly as it relates to the surveillance of American citizens. However, the FISC's rigor in protecting the Amer rights of Americans, which is reinforced by 90-day renewals of surveillance orders, is necessarily dependent on the government's production to the court of all material and relevant facts. This should include potentially favorable to the target of the FISA application that is known by the government. In the case of Carter Page, the government had at least four independent opportunities before the FISA court to accurately provide an accounting of the relevant facts. However, our findings indicate, as described below, material and relevant information was omitted. The dossier compiled by Christopher, St Christopher Steele, the Steele dossier, on behalf of the Democratic National Committee and the Hillary Clinton campaign, formed an essential part of the Carter Page FISA application. Steele was a longtime FBI source who was paid over $160,000 by the DNC and Clinton campaign via the law firm Perkins Cole and research firm Fusion GPS to obtain derogatory information on Donald Trump's ties to Russia. Neither the initial application in October 2016, nor any of the renewals, disclose or reference the role of the DNC Clinton campaign or any party campaign in funding Steele's efforts, even though the political origins of the Steele dossier were then known to the senior DOJ and FBI officials. The initial FISA application notes Steele was working for a named U.S. person, but does not name G Fusion GPS and Principal Glenn Simpson, who was paid by a U.S. law firm, Perkins Cole, representing the DNC, even though it was known by the DOJ at the time that political actors were involved with the Steele dossier. The application does not mention Steele was ultimately working on behalf of and paid by the Democratic National Committee and Clinton campaign or that the FBI had separately authorized payment to steal for the same information. Now there, that right there, the FBI had separately authorized payment to steal for the same information. That right there, Comey lied. Comey lied, and we now have absolute evidence of it, public evidence of it. The Carter, Page, the Carter Page FISA application also cited extensively a September 23, 2016 Yahoo News article by Michael Iskoff, which focuses on Page's 20, uh, July 2016 trip to Moscow. This article does not corroborate the Steele dossier because it is derived from information leaked by Steele himself to Yahoo News. That's amazing. Christopher Steele literally created a narrative by leaking information to Yahoo News and then used Yahoo News as his, uh, and then someone else used that Yahoo News article as his source to try and corroborate the Steele dossier. When in fact, that is not corroboration at all, it's just repeating the same narrative that Christopher Steele had produced. The Page FISA application incorrectly assesses that Steele did not directly provide information to Yahoo News. Steele has admitted in British court filings that he met with Yahoo News and several other outlets in September of 2016 at the direction of Fusion GPS. Perkins Coy was aware of Steele's initial media contacts because they hosted at least one meeting in Washington, D.C. in 2016 with Steele and Fusion GPS where this matter was discussed. Steele was suspended and then terminated as an FBI source for what the FBI defines as the most serious of violations, 
an unauthorized disclosure to the media of his relationship with the FBI in an October 30, 2016 Mother Jones article by David Korn. Steele should have been terminated for his previous undisclosed contacts with Yahoo and other outlets in September, before the page application was submitted to the FISA court in October, but Steele improperly concealed from and lied to the FBI about those contacts. Steele's numerous encounters with the media violated the cardinal rule of source handling, maintaining confidentiality, and demonstrated that Steele had become a less than reliable source for the FBI. Before and after Steele was terminated as a source, he maintained contact with the Department of Justice via then Associate Deputy Attorney General Bruce Orr, a senior DOG official who worked closely with Deputy Attorney Generals Yates and later Rosenstein. Shortly after the election, the FBI began interviewing Orr, documenting his communications with Steele. For example, in September 2016, Steele admitted to Orr his feelings against then-candidate Trump when Steele said he was desperate that Donald Trump not get elected and was passionate about him not being president. This clear evidence of Steele's bias was recorded by Orr at the time and subsequently in official FBI files, but not reflected in any of Page's of the Page FISA applications. During this same time period, Orr's wife was employed by Fusion GPS to assist in the cultivation of opposition research on Trump. Orr later provided the FBI with all of his wife's opposition research, paid for by the DNC and Clinton campaign via Fusion GPS. The Orr's relationship with Steele and Fusion GPS was inexplicably concealed from the FISA courts. According to the head of the FBI's Counterintelligence Division, Assistant Director Bill Priestap, corroboration of the Steele dossier was in its infancy at the time of the initial PISA, page FISA application. After Steele was terminated, a source validation report conducted by an independent unit within the FBI assessed Steele's reporting as only minimally corroborated. Yet, in early January 2017, Director Comey briefed President-elect Trump on a summary of the Steele dossier, even though it was, according to his June 2017 testimony, salacious and unverified. While the FISA application relied on Steele's past record of credible reporting on unrelated matters, it ignored or concealed his anti-Trump financial and ideological motivations. Furthermore, Deputy Director McCabe testified before the committee in December 2017 that no surveillance warrant would have been sought from the FISA courts without the Steele dossier information. The Page FISA application also mentions information regarding how fellow Trump campaign advisor George Papadopoulos, but there is no evidence of any cooperation or conspiracy between Page and Papadopoulos. The Papadopoulos information triggered the opening of an FBI counterintelligence investigation in late 2016 by FBI agent Peter Strzok. Strzok was reassigned by the special counsel's office to FBI Human Resources for improper text messages with his mistress, FBI attorney Lisa Page, no known relation to Carter Page, where they both demonstrated a clear bias against Trump and in favor of Clinton, whom Strzok had also investigated. The Strzok Lisa Page texts also reflect extensive discussions about the investigation, orchestrating leaks to the media, and include a meeting with Deputy Director McCabe to discuss an insurance policy against President Trump's election. That is amazing. I mean, good Lord, what do I add to this? This is in, I mean, I mean, I just did a video going through everything that was revealed by Admiral Mike Rogers through 2016 and 2017, and how that relates to the improper use of the FISA courts, which is absolutely criminal. But all of that information was readily available, and I was expecting this memo to essentially, you know, cover that information again. Instead, what we end up with is absolute evidence that the uncorroborated and quote-unquote salacious report produced by, or dossier rather, produced by Steele was entirely the basis of wiretap, not wiretapping, but investigating, surveilling an American citizen. 
not only are we seeing the breakdown of the uh, FBI's uh, attempts to involve themselves with someone of very low repute who took money from the Clinton campaign, had influence, been influenced not only by his own ideology against Trump, but the ideology of the DNC who was paying him $160,000. But we also see that Director Comey knew that this information was essentially false and attempted to blackmail the president with it anyways. And going through, we see the complete dismissal of Fusion GPS's involvement as being extremely biased, everyone's involvement being biased. And this, I hate to say it folks, but this memo is not the end. This memo is just the beginning of something much larger. We are going to be hearing from a lot of people in the coming days in house investigations related to this memo, which could not have been had openly if this memo was not released. And I do suspect that Steele is going to be subject to congressional investigation, if not criminal charges for his involvement in all of this, for providing information which was completely uncorroborated and unverified, which was later used for a FISA court application. And here's the worst part. This doesn't even begin to crack the surface of the fact that five to 8% of all FISA court requests and warrants used within the fight uh, under section 702 were illegal in nature were you and but this explains rather clearly how illegal they were i will say because what we're looking at here is a document of how easy it really is to lie to the fisa courts to get your warrant and dive in and actually spy illegally on american people under the guise of the protection of the secretive FISA court. There is a lot of information in here, and I would like to actually do a third video, probably today, although it might end up being my stream tomorrow, discussing all of the fine details, because we have to discuss Executive Order 12333, we have to discuss FISA Section 702, 704, and 705, we have to discuss um, just who Christopher Steele is, whether that's, I don't even believe that's his real name, to be completely honest, uh, just how culpable the DNC is, there is a lot of information that this this uh, this memo references, but doesn't actually directly address, and it absolutely needs to be. Oh, I am absolutely amazed, folks, because this is genuinely revealing. It's not what I suspected it to be, you know, a, a, con a, a condensed version or a digest of the information revealed on October 26th, uh, March 20th, and June 7th. Uh, of last year and the year before, irrespectively. No, this is actively stating that what we've seen here is criminal and unlawful actions by James Comey, by Christopher Steele, by the Democratic Party. Uh, well, okay, the Democratic Party didn't necessarily commit a crime. However, they certainly funded a crime, which makes them accessories to the crime. This is, I mean, I started recording this thinking that I would have a lot more to say, but it's clear what I'm going to have to do is study into this. But I hope you enjoyed my reading of the document because this is a very important document. Save this, bookmark this, download this, send it to everyone, because this is the beginning of a large investigation that is going to shake the foundations of American trust in the intelligence community. And here's the thing. I do think that this poses a national security risk. Even though I'm reading it, 
I know it poses a national security risk, not from outside forces, certainly not from Russia, but it poses a national security risk from our intelligence communities itself, who will see this as a reason to not trust their oversight and will choose to lie more, to hide more, to distract from anything possible that they can. And I suspect if things actually go absolutely horrible from one end to the other, we might be seeing rogue agencies be, or rogue elements within our intelligence community exposed, which is absolutely important for the recovery of the sovereignty of our nation. Thank you so much for listening. I will catch you next time. Mm -hmm.